hey, 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 Oh, no, 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 we are not doing that. I, uh, I do not want to do that much editing just for a running gag. Hey, this is Blog Eye Gamer, and welcome to another little iteration of Black Sheep Game Reviews. Hard to believe it's already been a month since Banjo was announced for Smash Brothers, huh? Being a fan of Banjo-Kazooie since its release, I am definitely among everyone that were very pleased with this DLC character inclusion. Now, while being added to Smash Bros. is great, it does leave us longtime fans of the series longing for... something new in light of this. Perhaps maybe a rare replay Switch port, or maybe a remaster of the original game with new visuals like with Crash and Spyro, or maybe even a brand new game after the lingering bitterest nuts and bolts made over 10 years ago. And while I thought Ukulele was fine enough, some felt it was too bogged down by old gaming conventions to live up as a spiritual successor. So, I figured while we wait in bated breath for any new Banjo-Kazooie related things after Smash, if at all, we take a look at the two lesser played Banjo games, Banjo-Kazooie Grinty's Revenge and Banjo Pilot for the Game Boy Advance. Yeah, funny to think that Rare actually did make some Game Boy Advance and even a couple DS games despite the Microsoft acquisition in 2002. Since Microsoft doesn't have a handheld system of their own, they made a deal with THQ to publish the solely Rare IP games. Of the GBA games, these include the aforementioned Banjo games, a remake of Saber Wolf, and perhaps the best-named game, it's Mr. Pants. It is kinda neat that Rare was still able to release games for Nintendo systems at this time, albeit handheld side projects. With the Banjo-Kazooie games, they are interested in their own rights. One being a small-scale adventure that tries its best despite limitations, and the other is... well, not even a Banjo game originally, but we'll get to that later. Grunty's Revenge was the first to get released, coming out in 2003 and was actually the first Rare game released after the Microsoft buyout. Although originally, the game was planned to be on the Game Boy Color under the title of Grunty's Curse, where Gruntilda curses Banjo's friends and even turns Kazooie into a monster for to use, but that was changed into what we have now. Though you can find references and roots of that version here and there in Grunty's Revenge. As to what goes on in this version, the game takes place between Banjo-Kazooie and Tui, where Grunty's assistant Klungo is trying in vain to move the boulder that trapped her. He finally gets the idea that he can't shift the giant rock and brings a mechanized body for Gruntilda's spirit to transfer into. Then the revenge happens where Grunty swoops in and kidnaps Kazooie from Banjo, which is actually a smart move since Kazooie pretty much does most of the work. After separating the two, Gruntilda then goes back in time in order to prevent Banjo and Kazooie from ever meeting each other. Uh, okay, sure. So yeah, time travel is a thing in this game and it's not that well thought out honestly. I get that this would be a way for Grunty to get rid of Banjo and Kazooie for good, but it's an unnecessary and not even really prevalent plot device. Because you never see or run into young versions of Banjo or Kazooie, so the stakes of them never meeting isn't there. Unless it goes back to before they were born. I mean, there are a couple noteworthy things that expand on the... lore of Banjo-Kazooie a little, I never thought I'd say that. But it's not enough to warrant the time travel, and the rest of the game wouldn't really be any different if it had none to begin with, like in the Game Boy Color version. Arguing weak implementation of time travel aside, Banjo gets help from his shaman friend Mumbo Jumbo, who can conveniently do time traveling magic as well, and sends him to the past to go after Grunty and save Kazooie. It's here that Banjo meets Bazai the googly-eyed mole, who was originally Bottles' grandfather in Grunty's Curse and possibly still a distant relative here. And like Bottles, Bazai provides moves for Banjo and later Kazooie to learn after collecting enough music notes. Although just about all the moves are from the N64 games, and that the time traveling magic apparently made Banjo forget those moves. Wow, that's an oddly specific memory to lose while time traveling, or maybe just from teleportation magic, but sure, at least it is an excuse as to why you need to learn these versions of the moves here. After that, you'll be running around Spiral Mountain, which acts as the hub world for the rest of the levels, with no Spiral Mountain in sight. Maybe the mountain isn't here yet in the past, but then why would it still be called Spiral Mountain before that? Okay, I need to stop overthinking a game in the series where you control a bear with yellow shorts and a bird stuffed into a backpack. I think it's best to just sum up the inconsistencies to time traveling retconning. Speaking of which, Banjo soon meets Jiggy Wiggy, even though you meet him in Tui and this takes place before that. And he's not the only Tui character either. There's also Honeybee who extends your health meter with empty honeycombs like she usually did in Tui. It really does feel like they're a retcon here just to have familiar characters they can reuse, but gameplay-wise, they serve their purposes just fine. Which means, just like in Tui, Jiggy Wiggy opens new levels once you've collected enough Jiggies. Though you just press A and open the levels right there and then instead of using the Jiggies or doing anything puzzle-related. Eh, I guess the developers want to keep it straightforward. 
and really this is a more simplified Banjo-Kazooie game, with the staples of exploring levels and collecting items. In every world, there's the usual 10 jiggies you find or earn through various means, 100 music notes, 5 jinjos that give a jiggy when all of them are found, and extra honeycomb pieces. Though the scale on the GBA is naturally a lot smaller, as each world consists of only a few areas, but there are still a considerable amount of set pieces to get as much as they could on the platform. However, there are still some limitations that hinder the experience a little bit. The game goes for a top-down isometric kind of viewpoint, which is fine for most of the game, but the depth perception can throw you off with some of the platforming, so it can be easy to misjudge some layouts because of the angle and level designs. Thankfully, there isn't fall damage, and you do have a drop shadow that can help with some jumps. The levels themselves are... okay. They do have familiar elements from the main games, but have some unique aspects to them, whether it be from the moves you learn in each stage, or from the transformations a younger Mumble can provide, after getting a Skull Totem for him from boss fights, that is. Is that an 8-track player? One cool thing about Mumble's transformations here is that they can all be used in every level once you unlock them, albeit pretty underutilized. Only the mouse transformation to go into small entrances is used more than twice in all the worlds, and the last transformation, the tank, is the only one you use in an old world to get a single jiggy, and is the only one you need to backtrack with a later ability to get to. And you thought needing the shoes and Boggy's race was silly? Seems like they didn't get to do much in terms of backtracking, but considering people may be mixed on going back to old worlds with new abilities to get jiggies like in Tui, it might not have been needed to expand upon. Instead, there are other things like the minigames, which do repeat in alternate variations, but are nice and simple distractions to mix up the challenges for jiggies. The rest involve using the skills of Banjo Kazooie's moveset. Oh, and you do get Kazooie back in the second world, by the way. The moves are faithful GBA recreations of the ones from the main game, with a few alterations. Like firing eggs with Kazooie in her Brigo blaster form when moving around, that was kind of neat. And there's even a couple bosses where you aim and shoot during these sequences. Also neat, but pretty brief. Another alteration was the Golden Feathers, as you can carry a lot more in this game, and the Wonder Wing invincibility you get from them is activated on specific pads, making it quite restrictive. Although it is pretty funny that here they can just seemingly casually walk around for long periods like this with no continuous music. A complete opposite of the frantic and precious nature of the original, for sure. Taking compromises into consideration, though, this still isn't a bad Banjo Kazooie game, as far as a handheld version goes. Although one criticism that is pretty common is the low difficulty and short length, as any veteran of the main Banjo Kazooie games will breeze through it within a few hours or so. I won't deny that, as there is evidence of Kon Kanta to make it that much shorter, such as Grunty's Industries being reduced to an area within the Ice World. And dying is pretty inconsequential when you can't continue right away in the last century where you came in. Only some timer challenges with surprisingly strict time limits in a couple later minigames tripped me up a bit. But I wouldn't say the short length and lack of challenge is a bad thing if you just want a quick and fun game to play in the Game Boy Advance. The visuals, apart from the perspective at times, are done well with some faithful pixel rendering of character models and some good sprite work too. Although Banjo's portrait here looks like he's seen some serious stuff. As for the sound, well, one aspect is a little rough, and that's the noises characters make during dialogue. Now, this was a somewhat common complaint in the original Banjo-Kazooie, but I find it charming. However, with the limitations of the GBA sounds... Yeah, I can now see why this kind of thing would be annoying after hearing how it was done in Grunty's Revenge. My advice is to speed up the text and the options, as it will greatly reduce this. So do that unless you want to hear constantly while trying to read everything. Fortunately, the music is alright. It's not by Grant Kirkhope, but the recreated and similar sounding original tunes by Jimmy Hughes is nice enough for GBA standards, though can be pretty repetitive. So if you're looking to play every Banjo-Kazooie game, then I do recommend Grunty's Revenge as a short and sweet entry. It's a quick game to complete, and while there is a ranking depending on how fast you complete it and being able to unlock the minigames to play whenever you want, it can be a one-and-done kind of game. Still, I had enough fun, and there is that signature lightheartedness rare games are known for, with some dialogue giving me a good laugh. No, I don't believe it! How could you? Thanks! Uh-oh, I think they forgot to put a line of dialogue here. Oh well, that just makes it funnier to me. Okay, that was Crisis Revenge. Not bad for a Game Boy Advance version of a Banjo game. But what about the other GBA one? Banjo Pilot. Well, strap yourselves in because believe it or not, this has more of a development history than Grunty's Revenge. You see, Banjo Pilot was originally not a Banjo game. Shocking that Rare would do something like this, I know. The game was going to be Diddy Kong Pilot, a more airplane and Kong focused follow up to Diddy Kong Racing. However, after the Microsoft acquisition and Nintendo not being very impressed with the initial game, Rare decided to retool the game with Banjo Kazooie instead. 
And this was after the small team that worked on this tried making the game using voxel rendered graphics, which while technically impressive, was too taxing on the system. So the development was switched over to reskinning the Mo7 style Diddy Kong Pilot, finally releasing as Banjo Pilot in 2005. Now, regardless of what this game once was, having Banjo fly a plane isn't actually that far-fetched. He was in the original Diddy Kong Racing as a racer after all. Kazooie, on the other hand, when she already is a bird that can fly? All I will say is that's like complaining that Sonic drives a car in his racing games. He's just doing it to be a good sport and I assume Kazooie had to as well, whether she liked it or not. As for the game itself, Banjo Pilot is a pretty standard kart style racing game complete with item pickups to deal with other racers that behave pretty much like the ones in Mario Kart. The similarities don't end there as the track layout is more akin to the most 7 style games, meaning that you are confined along the track despite being able to fly, as there are invisible walls and obstacles along the edges that can make you crash. Plus, you'll even slow down flying over rough terrain. For some reason. I could see maybe flying over lava or toxic waste affecting air resistance, but as to why this happens over grass... I don't know, video games. Vertical movement does factor in for the placements of item pickups and boosts to go through, so being in the air does have its purposes. Although in an old version of Diddy Kong Pod you would have been able to fly around freely, but had to stay within the directions of the pylons or else be disqualified if you bypass three of them. But this is a very unfinished version that was dropped in favor of invisible walls, among other things such as a motion control option for steering that would have been a novelty, but I'm glad it isn't here in Banjo Pilot because I would have had to done some roundabout ways in order to record that. As for the controls that are here, my only gripe is that sharp terms are with the R button while the L button does somersaults. So for a while I kept accidentally doing rolls when I wanted to do left sharp turns since I was used to doing that in other racing games. That and there are a couple of functions this game doesn't outright tell you about. One of those being a loop move you do by pressing down and L. It's actually much like the loop you can do in Diddy Kong Racing, except in Banjo Pilot it does have a practical use. If timed right, you can use it to avoid being hit by incoming items and may even do a small boost afterwards. Although while the game hints you can avoid attacks with L, it does not right tell you about the loop, so I kept doing rolls to no avail. And since I didn't have the manual, which lists the move as a barrel roll no less, I only found out about this maneuver by accident. Before, I simply relied on defensive items, but was still at the mercy of the AR bombarding me in true Mario Kart fashion, which is just as aggravating, especially when you get sniped right before the finish, YOU SON OF A bit. Another thing this game doesn't really tell you clearly is that with no item, you do have a default popgun-like weapon that fires bullets with the B button. Firing at others during standard races doesn't do much other than disrupt them a little, but there are targets in the form of Globos, where after shooting one, with the gun by the way, as items won't work, it activates a special boost that either acts as a series to go through with the last being a super boost, or an automated one that takes you across part of the course quickly. Your aim does need to be pretty precise to even get these guys, and given the draw distance may not always be easy, and you only get one chance to go through the boost or else it disappears. These were also target balloons to shoot in Diddy Kong Pilot, so if you're wondering why you shoot these dudes in the first place, that's why. However, they won't show up on the tracks until you unlock them through Chido the Spellbook, with pages of his you earn through races. It's also how you unlock other characters and things once they become available. In relation to Cheeto pages, there are four music notes you can grab in each track, which were the Kong letters originally, that act as multiplayers to get more pages after races. All it really does is make buying unlocks a little more faster, and most things aren't that expensive, so this system with Cheeto does come across as just another step for most of the unlocks. Well, there are a few things you can get, like a stop and swap reference, which is pretty funny that it was a running gag back then, and now it's implemented in the Xbox Live Arcade Banjo-Kazooie games. For the main content of the game, there are the expected amount of modes, such as the Grand Prix Cups to get the most points in four track races each, with a dogfight challenger duel at the end once you get a trophy. These are essentially boss fights where you periodically switch back and forth between attack and evasion to wield down their health in order to earn your Grand Prix standing. They do stand out a little for being something you need to do after the cup races, but it boils down to the same tactics for every character you face. Avoid their attacks, grab items when you can, and attack in between their patterns to take them down. Kind of an interesting diversion, even if there isn't much to it. And once you win, you get a bunch of Grunty's Revenge character assets to stand in for the cheering crowd, and character animations on the podium that make them look like animatronics. The other modes include single races, a time trial mode, and Jiggy Challenge, where you have to collect six Jiggies and win the race against the Challenger. Which should sound familiar if you played the Adventure 2 mode in Diddy Kong Racing, where you had to collect coins and win in mirror versions of tracks. And speaking of which, this game has mirror tracks too, only they're much more prevalent. There are only 16 tracks in this game, with Bottles being in charge of the starting Grand Prix races. Then you can unlock Gruntilda's mirrored versions of her Grand Prix mode. Also, Grunty here is in her original form, but doesn't speak in rhymes. I'm not sure where this fits in the Banjo-Kazooie timeline. 
or it's just an oddity that doesn't matter much in this game turned into a Banjo spinoff. So because of the limited amount of tracks, you'll be playing these a lot if you go for completion, and having mirror tracks in order to elongate the game does make the repetition apparent. The extra Grand Prix modes you unlock after Grunty 3 you race against fast Jinjos in 6 random courses, and Endurance Race with all 16 courses doesn't help with that either. Thankfully it's not too difficult to be as long as you're okay at kart racers, and even then you can unlock someone that pretty much breaks this game. There are 9 pilots you can play as with various stats, but there is one that is ridiculously overpowered. Bottles. He is super fast with good acceleration and handling, and flies in what looks like Donkey Kong's barrel plane from the Diddy version. He is essentially the TT from Diddy Kong Racing in this game, but is even more broken than TT if you can believe that. All you have to do to get him is win all of his Jiggy Challenges, which were not too tough nor was it much of a task as being all of TT's time trial goes to unlock that character. With Bottles, you can easily zoom past most racers and win with little to no problems. In fact, this was how I was able to 100% this game. I was able to use him to beat the rare dev time trials and get platinum trophies for all the Grand Prix races, which you attain by getting first place in every race. Kind of like getting the triple stars trophies in the latest Mario Kart now that I think about it. Of course, with this lack of a challenge in order to get everything easier, it was pretty tedious. But my efforts didn't go unrewarded as the rare logo in the intro became platinum as a result. So at least that's something. Overall, Banjo Pilot is... just okay. It's a fine enough kart racer, just that it's pretty basic despite being in planes. And it's pretty obvious that they put Banjo Visuals over an unreleased game, especially when they had to quickly do them after scrapping the Voxel Engine version. Not to mention things like these pictures for beating modes looking pretty hastily made to be thrown in here. Say what you will about Nuts and Bolts not feeling like a Banjo game, but at least that tried to incorporate as much Banjo elements as it could, to mixed results to say the least. With Banjo Pilot, it's pretty slapdashed. However, on a technical level, Banjo Pilot, or really Diddy Kong Pilot, is still fairly impressive on the GBA for its smooth visual fidelity. Unfortunately, one aspect that the devs couldn't hide from Diddy Kong Pilot is the music for the courses that were done by Robin Beelan and Jamie Hughes, as they didn't have time to replace them. So most of the music is very Donkey Kong sounding because of that. Though it's not bad music, just a little out of place. And the characters sound fine and not like in Grundy's Revenge, so it's actually better here in that regard. So that was Banjo Pilot. I decided to play this instead of Team Sonic Racing and Crash Team Racing Nitro Fueled. Go figure. Okay, this actually wasn't too bad either. And in a way you could say it led up to the vehicle-based Nuts and Bolts, which does have racing missions. And later on, Banjo Kazooie even became a 360 version exclusive character in the first Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing. I know those don't make any less absurd, just saying that Banjo Pilot wouldn't be the last time the Baron Bird do some racing. And after all that, I've completed every Banjo Kazooie game. Yes, even Nuts and Bolts. I'm one of the crazier fans. As for the GBA games, I'd say they're all right and worth checking out if you're interested enough. I mean, it's not like we're gonna get a new Banjo game anytime soon, so we might as well take what we can get. Even then, who knows, Battletoads is getting a new game by Rare. Even if not everyone likes how it looks, but I don't mind it. And Sea of Thieves proved to be a fun time with friends, even with a lackluster launch. So I do have more faith in Rare and Microsoft nowadays than I did a few years ago. So... switch ports of the Xbox Arcade versions at the very least? Wouldn't be a bad idea if Banjo's going to be in Smash, just saying.